This video is supported by Brilliant.org. I grew up in the era of the space shuttle. I grew up too late to see Apollo, but the space shuttle had a lot of swagger of its own. I mean, the thing was a friggin' space plane, for crying out loud. It had the poster on my wall and everything. It carried twice as many passengers as Apollo, could carry up big, huge payloads like the Hubble Space Telescope, and had cool Star trek -y names like Discovery, Challenger, and Endeavor. And the coolest thing was it was reusable. Even the booster rockets were recoverable. This was supposed to usher in the age of quick and easy spaceflight. That combined with the ISS looked like we were on the verge of having a permanent human presence in space and a cheap and easy way to get up there. The space shuttle, it turns out, was neither quick nor inexpensive. In fact, it cost over $450 million per launch to get up there, and even at its height, they only launched every three or four months or so. Then came the Challenger disaster in 1986, and then the Columbia disaster in 2003, Suddenly the space shuttle went from the darling of the space industry to a vehicle that wasn't completing its objectives, and it caused more deaths than any other spacecraft in history. It had become clear that the shuttle's days were numbered, and in July of 2011, NASA flew the last shuttle mission on board the Atlantis. The shuttle was now grounded, and America's manned space program with it. Today the shuttle as a whole is considered a bit of a mixed bag. It still holds a special place in our heart, and it absolutely has a lot of achievements and firsts that it accomplished, but it also kind of brought our entire manned space program to a halt. For the last seven years, the United States has had to rely on Russia and their 51-year-old Soyuz spacecraft. I should note that the Soyuz has been updated several times over the years. The most recent one was in 2016, but the original design from 1967 is pretty much the same as what they got now. But this dry spell is about to come to an end, thanks in part to SpaceX and the Dragon crew capsule. Avid viewers of this channel are, I'm sure, familiar with SpaceX and the fact that they were founded by Elon Musk with the tiny little goal of making humanity a multi-planetary species. Come on, Elon. Can't think bigger. But before you can put humans on Mars, you gotta put humans in space. And before you can do that, you gotta put things in space. SpaceX at this point has the things in space thing down. They're arguably the most successful private space launch company in the world in their workhouse Falcon 9 rocket. I did a video about that a while back. If you want to get a little bit of a history on that, you can check that out right here. The things they carry into space are, of course, launched on the Dragon cargo capsule, a fully autonomous craft capable of carrying 7,300 pounds or 3,310 kilograms to the space station and back to Earth. The Crew Dragon is similarly autonomous, but its cargo are human beings. The most precious cargo of all. Humans, of course, have special accommodations they need to consider, like oxygen. The most precious gas of all. And a temperature that doesn't freeze or roast them. The most precious temperature of all. Okay, I'll stop. All of that is to say that launching humans into space is a bit more complicated than launching up some freeze-dried ice cream. Up to seven passengers can fly on the Dragon crew capsule, and because this is SpaceX, it'll be with top-notch design, featuring carbon fiber seats with all controls on a flat panel screen where they can monitor everything from their position in space to the temperature of the cabin, which they can set anywhere between 65 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's good to know if any of them bring their significant other, they can argue over the AC the entire trip. And they'll get to do it in Daft Punk cosplay. Double trouble. The Crew Dragon has about 10 cubic meters of volume or about 350 cubic feet, which might sound small for seven people, but keep in mind, in zero gravity, you can use all that volume. You get a little more elbow room where you're not relegated to using floor space. I mean, look above you in the room that you're in right now. Imagine you could float around in all that space. Quite a big room, actually. As for maneuverability, the original Dragon features 18 Draco engines to maneuver the craft in space. Each of these can produce about 90 pounds of thrust. Obviously that doesn't sound like a lot, but in the frictionless anti-gravity of space, you don't really need much. But the Dragon 2 removes a couple of those Draco engines and replaces it with eight Super Draco engines along the side. Super Dracos can produce 16,000 pounds of force, and according to SpaceX, all of them together produce 120,000 pounds of force along its axis. The reason for this originally was because the plan was to land Dragon 2 propulsively because SpaceX is just really into doing that kind of thing. This was tested years ago, but was shelved in the last few years to opt for a more traditional landing at sea with parachutes, the old tried and true method. But the design with the embedded Super Draco stayed to serve as a launch escape system in case of a uh, <coughs> rapid unscheduled disassembly on the pad. Of course, the Dragon 2 has to know that there's something wrong in order for it to get away from it, so it's actually stuffed to the gills with sensors. Everything that can be measured on the Dragon 2 is measured. Everything from temperature, tilt, vibration, and sound. All these measurements are monitored and then audited later on. They're also used as inputs for the autonomous flight controls. 
This is nothing new for SpaceX though. They heavily data mine every single flight and anything that can be improved is improved on the next flight. This kind of obsessive data collection is just part of their corporate culture. NASA's already picked the first two astronauts that are gonna fly on the Crew Dragon, Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley. Bob Behnken is a veteran of two shuttle missions and he has a PhD in mechanical engineering. He's also a colonel in the Air Force and the chief of the astronaut office at NASA. Doug Hurley was a pilot on the very last shuttle mission, an engineer and a marine colonel, so I think these two guys are plenty qualified to sit there while the autonomous capsule does everything for them. And more importantly, they're plenty qualified to step in and fix something if something goes wrong. Now it goes without saying that the safety of the astronauts is the number one priority for NASA. So before they can fly with the Crew Dragon as part of the commercial space program, they have four different deliverables they have to give to NASA. These include a certification data package, phase safety review process, program requirements, and testing. SpaceX will deliver these on a few different flights. The first one that will test the launch abort system. The second one is the Demonstration 1 mission, or Demo 1, which will be an uncrewed flight to connect with the ISS, just like a regular Dragon mission, except with Dragon crew. And the third one would be the Demonstration 2 mission, or Demo 2 mission, that will actually feature Behnken and Hurley. Now these will be done on the tried and true Falcon 9 and not the Falcon Heavy. Elon actually announced earlier this year that the Falcon Heavy won't be rated for human space flight. Uh, it'll just be used for super heavy payloads. But there was one issue that NASA was a little bit concerned about in terms of using the Falcon 9 for manned space flight, and that's the load and go procedure that SpaceX uses. In September 2016, a Falcon 9 exploded during a static firing test on Cape Canaveral. This is what SpaceX charmingly calls a launch pad anomaly. Investigators have attributed it to a gap in the overwrap of a pressure vessel inside one of Falcon 9's fuel tanks. Basically, SpaceX uses supercooled liquid oxygen to get it as dense as possible so they can fit as much fuel as possible in the Falcon 9. Keep in mind that you know, they don't just need to launch, they need to land as well, so every bit of fuel helps. The problem is that supercooled oxygen can warm up and expand, leading to the kinds of problems that cause Facebook's satellite to go to Kaboom Town. So they found that the best way to keep the fuel from warming up and expanding and causing these problems was to fuel it up at the very last second. Now the idea of fueling up a rocket while people are actually sitting on it obviously makes NASA nervous for lots of different reasons, but after reviewing some of the data from Falcon 9 launches early this year in April, they approved the procedure. And just last month in August, SpaceX put up their own astronaut walkway on pad 39A at Cape Canaveral, so we're getting pretty close to this thing. The current plan is to launch Demo 1, the uncrewed mission to the ISS in December of 2018, and the first crewed mission, Demo 2, would be in April of 2019. Now yes, all of this is stuff to get really excited excited about, but ironically, the Crew Dragon may have a very limited lifespan. Just last week, Elon gave a talk presenting the first private citizen to fly on the BFR, the big Falcon rocket that's supposed to take astronauts to the moon and Mars and beyond. He said that once SpaceX starts performing crewed flights for NASA next year, they're going to move most of their research and development money into the BFR so that they can start doing flights for that in 2020 and 2021. Now, in case you missed it, they announced that the first private passenger is a Japanese billionaire named Yusaku Meizawa, who wants to do a project called Dear Moon, or he calls it Dear Moon. He wants to take seven or eight artists around the moon uh, for a giant art project, which is really interesting. It sparked a lot of cool conversations. You can find out more about it at a link right here. So short-lived though the Crew Dragon may be, it's still a huge step in getting the United States space program back on track. Now along with SpaceX, NASA is also contracted with Boeing for their own space capsule called the Starliner, which means for the first time in history, NASA is going to actually have two different vehicles that they can use to get astronauts up into space. This really might be the verge of a new era of space exploration. So what do you guys think about the Dragon capsule? Does that get you excited? Are you happy to see the United States getting back up into space? Do you miss the space shuttle? Tell me what you think down in the comments. Getting into space is hard. There's a reason why they call it rocket science. Now today, most of this is done on computers instead of rooms full of nerds with slide rules, but if you have an insatiable curiosity about how all this stuff works, one good place to start is brilliant.org. You don't just learn things at brilliant.org, you figure them out yourself with games and puzzles that make learning the material fun, but also helps you learn it in a way that makes sense to you and that you can apply to other areas of your life. That's the difference between being smart and being brilliant. Some courses to start with if you're into rocket stuff might be their classical mechanics course. You can learn how rocket engineers get around the tyranny of the rocket equation. From there you can move into gravitational physics and if you're really adventurous, check out the astronomy course and get a big picture look at the cosmos. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe to get access to their free weekly puzzles and brain teasers and the first 200 people that sign up for a full 
subscription that gives you access to all their courses, like I do, get 20% off your subscription for life. So if you haven't checked out Brilliant, really go check it out. It's a really fun site. Brilliant.org slash Answers with Joe. Link's down in the description. I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this channel, and I want to give a big shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are supporting, keeping the lights on, and, and uh, giving me all kinds of great ideas for videos. I really appreciate you guys. We have some new people to join. Let me murder their names real quick. We've got Joe Ferenc, uh, John Wallace, Devin Peterson, Juan Gallera, Jared Douglas Hageman, Colin M. Shaleen, Pete, Jeff Tony, Justin Volonsky, Rickard Lovstrom, I think, <laughs> Jens Astrup, Phil, Scott Boone, George Guglielmi, uh, James Gibbon, Chris LaCour, Damian Glass, Ian Castleman, Michael A., um, Ernest Joseph Obaro, Johnny Santara, and Michael Nunley. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to cool things that other people don't get access to, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Cool t-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Fun, nerdy stuff. You should go check those out. If this is your first time here, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. You might like those as well. And if you do, uh, hit the subscribe button. You'll be the first to see all my videos when they come out every Monday. All right. Thanks again for watching, you guys. Go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.